Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the panel on uh, bodies of evidence organized by the University of uh, Turin. I'm Sara Monteleone and I'm a policy analyst at the European Parliamentary Research uh, Center here in Brussels. And uh, the objective of this panel is to better understand the uh, strong points and drawbacks of the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and to consider it under the European and also uh, United States perspective. Uh, before to give the floor to Professor Hugo Pagallo from the uh, University of uh, Turin, who is a, a professor of legal informatics, uh, and will also moderate the panel, I will introduce our uh, speakers. The first speaker is uh, Mark Rothenberg, president of Electronic Privacy Information Center. He's also a teacher of information privacy law in upper government, uh, the Georgetown Law. We'll uh, consider the divergences, but also uh, similarities between uh, the EU and US regulations. We will uh, also have uh, Konstantinos uh, Karakalikos, uh, the managing director of the standards organization of uh, IEEE. We also covered several positions at the European Patent Office, and we'll uh, talk about the need to reclaim our digital identity in the algorithm age. Uh, then we move to uh, Argiro Karanasiu, uh, who is an assistant professor specializing in IT and media law at the Ber Burnham Mott University. And we'll uh, also uh, talk about multimodal data fusion and uh, artificial intelligence and consider various uh, instances of automated decision uh, making. Uh, then we uh, will give the floor to Alessandro Spina, who is uh, currently a data protection officer at the European uh, Medicine Agency, although he's not representing the agency today, and he's also a visiting lecturer in uh, global risk regulation at the University of uh, Fribourg. We will talk about uh, risk regulation and uh, data protection. And last but not least, we have Margot Kaminsky, who is an associate professor of law at the Colorado uh, University. Uh, also will provide us with the, uh, the US perspective and will present uh, on body in physical spaces and uh, virtual uh, spaces. So I give you now the floor, uh, Hugo, to set the scene.
participants to satisfy certain standards, the practical consequence for those participants is that they will raise the level of their business practices. And in the US, we actually describe this as the California effect. And we talk about it in the context of pollution and auto emissions. We say that um, California has very high standards. If you want to sell a car in California, you have to make the cleanest engine uh, you can. Uh, but the practical consequence you see for not only US manufacturers, but auto manufacturers around the world is if you're going to make a car that satisfies the California standard, you're likely to produce the same car for other states in the US and other countries around the world. So California has very robust views as to uh, environmental protection provides a practical benefit for individuals outside of California. And you see, in the U.S., you know, as consumers, we understand the impact of the EU General Data Protection Regulation as providing a benefit to U.S. consumers because U.S. internet firms are likely to not require to adopt many of the practices mandated by the GDPR. Now, I need to draw a distinction here because sometimes there's a bit of confusion. People say, well, this sounds very much like uh, extra for extraterritorial force of law. The Europeans are trying to tell the Americans what to do. Well, actually, that's not correct. No one requires an American company to provide services in Europe. No one requires an American company to collect data on Europeans. That's a choice that a company makes. And as a consequence of that choice, certain obligations follow in the regulatory regime. Just as companies that are marketing to American consumers for drugs and food and clothing and, and consumer electronics have to satisfy the requirements of the US regulatory regime as a consequence of entering the US market. So it's important to understand in the first instance the ratcheting up effect, and secondly, not to confuse it with the extraterritorial application of law. I mentioned the practical benefit for US consumers. I believe there's a practical benefit as well uh, for good, good businesses. And by this, I mean that businesses that have an interest in maintaining a presence in internet markets, not a business that creates a clever app to deceitfully capture the personal data of its user to sell it to a marketing firm or political firm and then to disappear overnight. Many app developers do that, by the way. They are not happy about because they might get caught. But a company that intends to maintain a presence in a market to develop relations with customers to create trust through data protection law, I think will view favorably as a general proposition of GDPR. I think it's also good for the long-term stability of the internet economy, which continues to be fragile, not only because of technology, rapid changes in business practice, but growing uh, hostile attack, cyber attack, and foreign adversaries, which also disrupts commercial markets. And finally, most importantly for me, it's good uh, actually for book sales because we have an elevation of the privacy law source book after the complete text of the GDPR. So thank you, Dean. Um, <laughs> now, let me say a couple of words about the challenge ahead on the US side. And I think there are simply two categories we need to consider whether we're doing an adequacy analysis or the essential equivalence analysis uh, suggested in, in the Schrems decision. And that is, first of all, what is the legal standard under which the data will be collected and processed? And second, what is the quality or existence of the legal institutions charged with the enforcement of the legal standard? It's the second category that I think sometimes slips below the radar when people are making their determinations. And the short answer in the United States is that we start kind of in the rear of the group. First of all, we do not have a comprehensive data protection law similar to the GDPR or the Open Data Protection Record, but we also don't have a federal data protection agency. We don't have a single entity that actually mirrors uh, the e European DPA. So you can argue, and certainly the US government has, and some scholars have, that if you put enough pieces together, you begin to have what looks like a data protection regime, and you begin to have the elements of, of the oversight regime that would be required in the GDPR. I think that's an important uh, conversation. But I will um, highlight a 
few recent developments which are going to shake that somewhat fragile structure already in place on the U.S. Uh, side. Um, the first is with regard to the legal standard, as you may be aware, in the past week, uh, Congress uh, enacted the President signed a renewal of the Section 702 authority on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. The Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act provides broad authority for the collection of information about individuals with, I won't say no judicial review, but I'll say minimal uh, judicial review. The 215 program, which was targeted toward uh, American citizens, underwent a substantial reform a couple of years ago. That was called the Freedom Act. The 702 program, which is targeted to non-U.S. citizens, was up for consideration for reform, but the reform did not take place. And I think the uh, decision uh, to renew 702 is quite consequential, uh, particularly under a privacy shield analysis of the current state of data protection. You recall, of course, that it was uh, the disclosures of Edward Snowden uh, which helped propel through the parliament at a time when it was frankly not clear if that reform was going to take place. Snowden's regulations were largely about electronic surveillance, and I would argue that the 702 renewal has placed that back on the table. Okay, brief point on legal institutions, and, and then I'll wrap up. So we have a problem in the second category. We have a problem in the second category because the federal agencies that are supposed to make up this mosaic data protection are simply not functioning. Uh, the Privacy uh, and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, which is supposed to be a five-member commission to provide independent oversight of intelligence agencies, has at the moment uh, one member. Uh, the Federal uh, Trade Commission, which is the primary agency responsible for consumer protection, has uh, two members. It's supposed to have five also. Um, and we just learned this week that the chairman of that commission has received a judicial appointment. There's no replacement for her. And the other member of the commission was planning to leave a year ago, but decided to stay on until her phase was filled. We also have no ombudsman at the State Department who's responsible for the uh, privacy shield. So as expensive as property is in Washington, D.C., and as difficult as it is, to rent an apartment nowadays. Apparently there's a great deal of space available in these various privacy agencies that are responsible for enforcing U.S. privacy laws. So if you need a place to stay next time here in Washington, perhaps you could start by the Civil Liberties Oversight Board. I'm sure they'll give you an office because they're not using it. Uh, so there you have it. Okay. Well, what happens next? I mean, you know, it's really fascinating at, at this moment. I've you know, said for about 20 years that in the great debate on privacy, where there's a common interest in both sides of the Atlantic uh, toward greater uh, protection, regrettably, the U.S. and its closest trading partners seem to be moving in opposite directions. On the EU side, 
Yeah, the one. 
nonsense and then were actively promoting this uh, throughout the technical communities. And we have started uh, a series of social standardization projects and uh, most of them did also need to be with data. Yeah? You see data privacy process, the transparency of autonomous systems, the standard on time is Is this working then? Yes. Okay. Is it working? Do you have a presentation? No.
Right, okay, so uh, it will be a while until we see our slides, but thank you very much for uh, sticking around. I know it has been a long day for you all, and thank you very much, Ugo and Shara, for the kind invite. Um, what I'll be doing is really um, taking some of the guilt off the shoulders of the technical community and moving it onto the shoulders of the legal community. <laughs> so I will be following down uh, uh, Constantino's path and um, I will be um, mainly reflecting thoughts uh, revolving around the concept of autonomy as well. Um, so, um, what I'll be talking about is uh, AI's momentum in retail. Of course, there is not much to explain here. Um, it's been um, calculated that roughly every day we are called to take 3,500 decisions and we're being lazy when it comes to that. So, half of these decisions are now delegated to our BPAs, wearables, smart agents, smartphones, you name it. Um, of course, consumer data is easier to analyze, so technology is there. Um, but most importantly, there is a low risk. So there is low value to false negatives and to false positives, meaning if Netflix suggests the wrong movie, well, it's not going to be that bad for the consumer. So that's where we are nowadays when it comes to the um, hype over AI in retail. And uh, what I'll be focusing on is really the mechanics of this automated decision making and most importantly, um, a tiny area that up until this day has been overlooked and this is what I call the multi-model data fusion. Um, what I'll be talking about briefly today because I'm trying to summarize a year's work in 10 minutes. Um, so I'll be talking about the biostructures, what comes in mind when we actually reason a decision being taken. Then moving on to technostructures, how machine learning um, um, reasons, let's say, the decisions that are being automatically met, what is the AI logic if you wish to follow down the terminology used in the GDPR, and most importantly, what happens when we merge these two interfaces, what are the um, risks and limitations in the light of the GDPR. I have injected one or two notes uh, that have to do with the US, but again, I'm not an expert, so it's just some preliminary observations there. Um, so. The first thing that I've looked at uh, for this paper, uh, this is a paper that I presented about a month ago at the Zvi Mater Center in Israel. So I would welcome your feedback because I'm still trying to uh, strengthen the argument here. Um, we had a look at the biostructures trying to understand why consumers uh, decide the way they do. There is nothing new there. Uh, what they are eventually doing is that they are making choices relying on a combination of memory, knowledge and heuristics. What is important to keep in this slide is the bounded rationality, meaning, believe it or not, when we are taking a decision, we are not always doing that in a rational manner. Uh, we are restricted um, within the limitations of the information that's been given, regardless of the amount of the choices uh, that a consumer is being afforded. Now, things are different when you're trying to explain what goes on um, when you're effectively constructing large-scale predictive models from massive data sets, and this is um, machine learning in uh, a nutshell. Um, of course, I've avoided all the technical nitty-gritty, and I have just two um, uh, different types of uh, data processing. One is the feature engineering uh, that we move from raw data to structured data. And what I wish to focus on here is labeling, meaning that we then have to annotate data by using user feedback, sometimes using it as a feed forward. Uh, and it's only then that a sample data can be used to train a predictive model. What is interesting here is that when uh, people that are employing machine learning techniques uh, are doing so, eventually they're trying to formalize common sense reasoning, that would be the previous slide, then again by taking into account any shortcomings in logic. Um, so this um, refers to the issue of bounding rationality um, and it's also um, a way of embracing uncertainty. I can think of a few examples if you wish me to elaborate further during the Q&A. Now, um, what is interesting is that we've moved one step past 
the um, automated decision-making um, processes that uh, we are aware of up until this day. So uh, a few examples I mentioned here, they range from mere education, uh, sorry, educated guesses, uh, Netflix, Amazon, um, and the likes to use data about consumers so that they can themselves make educated uh, guesses about preferences. Building automated purchases, this is where the Internet of Things uh, come into the picture. Integrated services, I have um, here an example uh, of Siri trying to book a flight to San Francisco for a consumer who also wants to eat at a four-star Thai restaurant. They do not want to be spending more than $50 and they want this to be at a walking distance so that the pedometer completes the necessary daily steps. Um, now, what is interesting here is the next step. And the next step is the mixed interfaces. So, uh, in essence, what really happens when we are using data that has been collected through different nodes and it's fused together with artificial intelligence, meaning that we are effectively um, merging the slides that I showed you earlier when it comes to boundary rationality um, with human reasoning and, of course, the um, non-monotonicity to use um, some, some sort of... Um, um, different wording here uh, when it comes to AI reasoning. And this is where the problem lies. Um, so I call this Internet of Bodies uh, in accordance with uh, the theme for this year's conference and um, it ranges from a mere monitoring uh, to deciphering uh, the data that's been collected to digital data up until using this data to train artificial intelligence, in other words, to simulate uh, behavioristic um, uh, manners of reaching a decision. And the latter can be seen clearly in the uh, example of DeepMind's PathNet, uh, which uses uh, effectively deep learning methods um, to be able and uh, have a more adaptive system. Now, why is this important when it comes to the GDPR, when it comes to the purposes of this conference? Uh, well, obviously, there are specific challenges involved for autonomy. One might say that certain trade-offs are inevitable when one is training data sets, and that's perfectly understood. Then again, it has the ability to lead to consumer frailty and to cognitive limitations, effectively amounting to manipulation. So what are the solutions then? What is the afforded protection? Well, I had a very brief look in uh, US legislation. And I have to say that I was a bit um, unhappy with I, what I found. Uh, let's take a look at, for example, the FDA. I saw that uh, mixed interfaces, mainly um, devices, for example, that uh, they operate on uh, VCI, uh, they are classed as uh, low-risk devices. And the only aim there should be general wellness, which is something that can be satisfied. Uh, when it comes to uh, the GDPR, uh, what I found was that although we do have the right to understand a priori uh, the data that's being collected, the problem is that um, it's not always possible to um, exhaustively identify all the data features. Um, and at the same time, we, do, we are afforded the right to contest a posteriori, but again, the problem is that labeling is actually a sine qua non to machine learning in mixed interfaces. Um, are there any other alternatives? Well, last but not least, I looked at the right to explanation. Uh, of course, it does not amount to transparency at, as it has been shown time and again. Um, but what is really interesting is that although it does follow legal reasoning, uh, since it's premised on explaining and not on completely understanding how uh, the black box works, then again, um, it does not fully address the issue of um, um, legal uncertainty. Uh, take, for example, the bounded rationality from the biostructures merged with the non-monotonicity from tractor structures. And um, it is really hard to explain this if it is looked out of context. And this is where um, my uh, observations uh, end. Um, I have included brief recommendations as far as uh, this issue of mixed interfaces goes. Um, it seems that we are looking at um, a person-specific um, 
it seems that we are actually addressing these challenges with a, a person-specific methodology rather than a context-specific methodology, uh, whereas we actually need to be enhancing our understanding and focus on two main issues. One is the modus operandi, and the second one is the, operator, the uh, operator's interpretation of performance, and uh, I will leave things there by stressing the importance of a social context-specific consideration for this to move forward. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you want to be part of this discussion, uh, I will end this by some shameless self-promotion, um, calling you to have a look at the 13 AI project, a series of transatlantic dialogues, which will uh, debut later in February, featuring um, interviews, podcasts namely, with uh, many different um, um, scholars, uh, ranging from different disciplines, not just law, so it should be adding to the momentum. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Alessandro. Uh, and uh, let me start that uh, Alessandro will deliver his own things, although he's uh, working on DNA. Uh, but uh, the following is going to be the case. Thank you. The Thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. And yes, I think the reason why across the Atlantic on the different direction from US and Europe. Back in the 80s, when in the US uh, the, the Red Book, French Red Book, uh, there was an attempt uh, coming from cybernetic science to regulate this in a systematic way. And the approach of this control was based on this assessment, this management, this tripartite dimension of this regulation is what we find in many regulatory systems such as the laws on food safety, aviation safety, and et cetera. And at that moment, probably it can be said that from the US to Europe, there was a, a, a wide global adoption this regulatory regime. Now, the idea that the GDPR has remained this central to this course is something that uh, some of the uh, scholars have pointed out. Uh, I think it's not only a quantitative measure uh, uh, noticing that the word this was only 
all know that uh, there are no, I, I guess we would say, no objective uh, understanding of the idea of rights. That's how our legislation is, is, uh, is constructed. The, the same
Great, thank you to uh, all of our speakers. I think uh, we had an uh, excellent uh, presentation uh, uh, so far. I'm afraid we have only five minutes uh, left for questions, but we are, yeah, actually, I will like to give the floor to the audience. Uh, I can see already some hands uh, raised there. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Alunga Rojas. I'm a, a law and science and technology PhD student. My question, uh, well, I have two. Actually, for the US, concerning the U.S. system, and uh, it's the first is kind of like an observation question, and the second is a full-fledged question. So uh, I know in 2013, for example, the, the the Supreme Court in the case of Clapper and Amnesty International wrote that uh, there can be no action against uh, the government for surveillance. Uh, there, can no, that there can be no action against the government for surveillance cases if there is no actual injury to the data subject. And now. Uh, that was 2013. Now, 2017, October, the privacy shield is uh, negotiated and accepted between the EU and the US. And bam, like by magic, in uh, the, another case, Atias and versus Cape Fest, Cape Care Fest, sorry, uh, in December 2017, first, December 2017, there is a decision. The DC uh, Circuit Court rules that 
uh, that's a, there, is, there is no need to prove direct harm uh, in case of a breach. So that is like, it, it doesn't, the first case, the amnesty case doesn't concern data breaches, yes, but it somehow underlines the principle of uh, direct injury for action. So can we say this is, uh, the privacy issue is coming to maybe go against this strong principle of stare decisis in, a, in the common law system, like uh, the US where the Supreme Court kind of lays, is, 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 has a tradition of laying down the, the, step, the, the principles to follow. Because the Supreme Court gives a rule, a ruling, and the privacy issue comes in, and then lower courts begin going against the Supreme Court rules, maybe to accommodate the privacy issue negotiations. I don't, I would like to hear your, <laughs> your thoughts on that. And can I go to the second question? Or I continue? And the second question is, um, I read recently that the US, the Senate, kind of uh, gave, uh, voted a rule which uh, obliges data breach subjects or against financial companies to go through arbitration instead of litigation. Now, uh, that, and I hear from the, in the US system, arbitration is quite expensive. So technically, could, could we say that's like limiting uh, litigations against companies? And if that's the case, isn't this unfair to US uh, data subjects because the, the, the US is accommodating, uh, pri uh, is, giving the, is providing litigation chances for EU citizens under the privacy agreement, but asking its own citizens to go through arbitration, which is rather expensive. Isn't that contradictory or unfair to US uh, data subjects? Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, there was another question, I think. Yes, Justin, here in front. 
Um, thank you. Um, uh, Charles Robb, University of Edinburgh. This is a question for uh, Konstantinos about standards. Um, I, I think it's, it's very commendable that the IEEE is developing the standards for AI that you've um, talked about. And uh, we were discussing this last week in London with one of your colleagues, Alan Winfield, who was involved, very much involved in doing this. But there are a couple of questions about, about standards. Uh, one is, um, even though it seems to me that you have a pretty open process of developing those standards, um, how do you guard against the level of standards being lowered through the, uh, the pressure by certain groups, let us say industry groups, that don't really want high standards? In Europe, we've had this experience a number of years ago with the European Standards Organization trying to put out some privacy standards. Uh, the second uh, question, uh, the second point is how you get standards to be potent in terms of their recognition within legislation so that they aren't simply part of a sort of voluntary, uh, self-regulatory um, uh, market situation, which might result in lots of companies adopting the standards, but still it's not the same as statutory uh, 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 involvement. And the third aspect, and this is looking further into the future, is how do you get, you talked about uh, te technical people not having self-reflection and not thinking about responsibility and accountability. Is it possible to embed that in the training and the education of uh, technologists, computer scientists, data scientists, and so on? There's very little, it seems to me, in the current curricula for those subjects which would encourage people to understand that while they're young enough to uh, uh, have it affect their practices. It's usually, you know, the law, the ethics, the social responsibility stuff is usually tacked on at the end of a, a year's curriculum in uh, certain um, uh, computer science subjects. So how do you turn that around? Okay, yes, please. Um, have is it, yeah, a very question, yeah, <laughs> I had before just him. Okay. Um, since I'm one of the happy European women who are within the standard procedure, um, I'm from an Austrian union, and we are a member of the Glo Uni Global um, trade union for um, the service sectors. And they invited us, thank you, to participate on this standard on employers' data protection. Yeah? And there exactly that, what was mentioned just before, happened. So we had these meetings with IT specialists and experts and engineers, technicians. And then the, the, so the, the came up the suggestion that we do these standards just for companies smaller than 250 and, um, employees. So, 250. It was just a suggestion when talking to each other. But this would mean for, at least for Austria and other European countries as well, it's just 80% of the employees who would come to have these standards. So, it would be much, much, much lower than the GDPR. And the the problem I see with this is exactly what the former was said. If you have the standards, they, you think just as an enterprise you're on the safer side, but you're not because the GDPR is much more stronger and gives the employee much more data protection than a standard.
listen to more.